Hey, it's your guy Tyrell back with the interviews. In today's video, we're going to briefly look at the issues that Italy encountered against Greece to secure Euro 2020 qualification. But before we do that, don't forget to give our video a thumbs up if you do enjoy it. The bell below does give you daily notifications regarding our organic, unfiltered soccer slash footy analysis. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. But now, let's get to the starting lineups. We look at Italy, more of a 4 3 3. Chiesa, Immobile, and Insigne up front in midfield. They were more Borella, Jorginho, and Verratti. Then we move to Greece, more of a 4 2. 2-3-1, Bakazeta up front, ahead of Kouloris, Zeka, and Limnius, and in midfield, Bouchalakis and Corbellis. So now, let's get to the first half, see how both sides look to approach the game, and how Greece frustrated Italy. So we break down Italy against Greece, we have to look to the limited chances that were created in that first half, and we have to identify why that occurred. We look at Greece's shape, we look at how Italy approached the game, and when we get to the board, we see what should be a 4-2-3-1 that technically drops into a 4-4-2 without the ball. However, Greece's shape was lopsided, and that, that was down to the fact as to how Italy were looking to approach the game. On the ball, Italy kind of shifted into a back three with D'Ambrosio, in line with a Cherby and Bonucci and allowed Spinozola space to adopt with on the left hand side. Why was that? Well, Insigne was taking up narrow positions ahead of Bakakis and trying to shift it into that space near Chatsidiakos. So that's where he was going and Bakakis often stepped to him and Spinozola was now tasked with pushing out to the left-hand side. That made it somewhat easier for Liminios because what happened there was that when he was looking to close down space, what he would end up doing was that he'd close off the blocking lane for the ball to go out to Spinozola. And if the ball was clipped out to Spinozola, he would track back. The easy option for Italy here is to get quick switches out, so it would force Bakakis to step out to Spinozola, and then force Chata Zidiakos to move over into the path of Insigne, but we didn't see that often, and they weren't really troubled down that left-hand side. And what made it a bit odd was that when Insigne did drift out to the left-hand zone, Spinozola would also be aligned with the Italian back line, so it was more of a flat, narrow back four rather than having full back backs pushing forward if Insigne moved out to that touch line. For the most part he didn't and you had Spinozola a bit higher and on the right hand side D'Ambrosio didn't push forward and you had Chiesa often adopting positions down in the in the wide touch line role and what he ended up doing there was that they wanted him to go 1v1 with Staphylidis but what happened there that without D'Ambrosio pushing forward and with Barella marked out of the game by Bouchalakis it was very easy for Greece to cope with that but that with that threat of Chiesa because like I said it's Chiesa 1v1 against them they could have Corbella shift out they can even have Bouchalakis step out and then have Corbella shift out to Bordella and that could help them but he didn't really offer much of a threat because when we do look at it they did on two occasions they had a Cherby clip out diagonal balls because he wasn't pressed to Chiesa the first time he took on Staphylidis drifted outside and then delivered a nice cross through the six yard box but no one attacked it and besides that he never really offered a threat when a Cherby clipped diagonal balls out to him. A Mobile was isolated in that center forward role and now it was about how Greece were looking to stop Italy's midfield because they did sit off of the back three when Italy were in possession and that was for large spells of the game and it was because D'Ambrosio wasn't pushing forward so Kularis didn't really have to step to him and that was key he obviously did block try to block off passing lanes but he didn't have to track back so he stayed a bit higher near Bakazetas and why that was pivotal is because Jorginho was often dropping off into that space and there he had two markers near him so he never really impacted the game and then on the left hand side you had Verratti and we had Zeka step to him on several occasions he was covering a ground throughout the pitch but his predominant role was to step to Verratti when he got on the ball and like I said Barella was pushing a bit higher against Bouchalakis and not really affecting the game so that meant that with those three marked out of the game you had Bonucci and Acherbe with time on the ball to deliver diagonal balls out into the wider areas Bonucci didn't really do a good job there Acherbe like I said often delivered diagonal balls out to Chiesa but he wasn't offering a threat in that right-handed zone and when you really look at it 
as the game wore on, technically they wanted to be more of two banks of four, but they didn't have to be. But as it wore on, that's kind of how it shifted out because what they really wanted was they wanted a marker on Jorginho, they wanted a marker on Verratti, and they got that. Zeka stepped into the path of Verratti, and if he needed to close down Bonucci, he would block off the passing lane to Verratti to ensure that he couldn't get on the ball or that pass couldn't be played. And the same thing happened down the opposite side. They wanted Bakazeta to stay onto Jorginho but when he did push out and step to a Cherby he would block off that passing lane there was one time where we saw Buchalakis step to him but for the most part if they needed any marker to step into that role it could have been Corbellis based off the fact that his job was to just clear out any danger in between the lines but there really wasn't any movement there like I said Chiesa was holding the width on the touch line Barella was marked out of the game by Buchalakis and it was only Insigne who could have possibly drifted off Bukakis to move into that space and that's the only real threat that Corbellis had to worry about because Italy had three players deep they had a Spinozola and Chiesa out in the wider roles and the midfield were getting shut out of position sometimes we saw Jorginho shift out to the left but that wasn't really offering much of a threat and on the rare occasion that we saw those two drift off deeper and get on the ball they try to play long balls over the Greek backline, but that didn't connect with any teammates. And when you really break down that first half as a whole, it was Greece who had the best opportunity that saw Limnios break into the box, following some great combination play down the right-hand side, and he forced Donnarumma into a save. So before we get into the second half, we have to mention that Bernadeschi did come on for Chiesa, and he did offer more of a threat as the game wore on, more so based off the fact that he wasn't solely looking to get the ball on the touch line he was varying his movement dropping off narrow combining with teammates and often switching off to the other side to create overloads with that being said when we do do move to the second half Greece dropped off into more of two banks of four with the roles up front more defined Bakazeta sticking onto Jorginho Zeka stepping to Verratti and we also had Insigne who was now dropping off into space in behind Corbellis to intentionally drag out Bakakis but also to receive the ball in that pocket of space. Italy did create more chances as the half wore on and that was possibly based due to the fact that Greece's energy levels dipped. So when we do look at those chances, a lot of them stem down the left hand side and the first opportunity highlights that perfectly. So when we look to the first example, it's Bonucci on the ball and Bakazeta stepping to him. Usually when we have Bakazeta stepping to him, he does block off the passing lane into Jorginho, but this time we end up seeing Zeka step out to Jorginho. That's a miscommunication from Greece. And what we end up seeing there is that Bonucci can easily slide the ball out to a chair bay, who now finds Verratti dropping off deeper because Zeka stepped into the path of Jorginho. Now with Verratti on the ball, Limnios does step out to him. And what we do locate is Insigne making a run in between Bakakis and in between Corbellis to get a long ball from Verratti into left half space. Chatzidiakos does come across and as he comes across Insigne lobs the ball over the net. Great movement from Insigne, great work from Italy to locate the miscommunication and the pressing error from Greece to exploit that space in down the left hand side. However, Insigne is unable to convert but it does show that there is promising openings behind this Greece back line. When we look to the next example, it's this time Zeka on Verratti and he does well to press him. But what happens here is Verratti slides the ball out to D'Ambrosio. So D'Ambrosio now is in a narrow position and Kularis looks to block off the passing lane into Bernadeschi. That's fine. We see Greece's back line shift over and it does get a bit narrow. And what ends up happening here is that with D'Ambrosio not being pressed in in Greece's half, he locates a mobile towering into the back post in behind Bakakis, who is shifting out into more of a central position. He delivers that cross into the box, and Immobile does tower over Bakakis to nod the effort down, and it forces the keeper to push it out for a corner kick. What we should highlight there is that Insigne does break off in behind Bakakis and Immobile, and perhaps if Immobile left it, it would leave Insigne free on goal, and that's based off the fact that Limnios doesn't track his movement because he's focused on Spinozola 
adopting a high position on that left touch line. And unfortunately for Italy, Immobile did get onto it and he did force the keeper into a save, but perhaps if it does go over him, Insigne has the better opportunity. But that's a 2v1 overload at the back post. And that's something we didn't see from Italy in the first half. Shortly after that, it's a similar issue that gets Italy into a good position. We have Bonucci free to step forward. And oddly enough, we have two markers on both sides of Jorginho and that's back and that is Zeka. So what we end up seeing here is that Insigne now is ahead of Bakakis and he does occupy that position. But unlike the first half where Chiesa was often on that right touch line, here we have Bernadeschi shifting over to that left hand side identifying that Limnios isn't going to track him like we saw in earlier stages. He didn't track Insigne's run and here Limnios was still occupying Spinozola and ensuring that he doesn't push forward. What Greece doesn't see is that Bernadeschi peels off that space that Insigne does create by shifting over and drawing out Bakakis and Bonucci's long ball meets Bernadeschi in that left half space. Unfortunately for him, he volleys the effort first time and it is wayward of the net. But again, it just highlights the overload down that side. Limnios not tracking the run. No one really calling for Corbellis to track that run and it allows another free Italian attacker into that space and behind Bakakis but they waste it once again. When we do look to Greece they did have one opportunity that should have resulted in a goal or forced Donnarumma into a save and it stems from their pressing. It's Zeka finally getting the better of Verratti and dispossessing him and the big issue here was that you had Spinozola high in a left-handed zone and when you win the ball there there is space for Greece to attack and it did see Limnios break in beyond Spinozola and for the first time his high positioning did benefit Greece and they slid the ball into him and he ends up taking on a Cherbe and he ends up cutting onto the outside of that box and when he delivers a cross through the six yard box it evades everyone including D'Ambrosio and it falls to Kularis who fires his effort into side netting but it's a great opportunity for Greece to force Donnarumma into a save and it possibly should have seen them get the opening goal which rightly so they possibly did deserve based off their first half performance but Italy were growing into the game and shortly after that they were able to develop the build-up that led to the penalties. When we look to the buildup of the penalty awarded to Italy, it does stem from another pressing breakdown from Greece. It does see Zeka stepping to a Cherbe, which means that he leaves Verratti free. And when he steps into that space and blocks off the passing lane to Verratti, we do see a Cherbe slide the ball out to Spinozola. Limnios takes a while to get out to Spinozola, and it gives Spinozola time to identify that Insigne is shifting to the left touch line. When he plays the ball into Insigne, who rarely shifted out into that zone, now now Insigne is able to take on Bakakis. Corbellis does come across and when Insigne does cut in, he locates Verratti who was free because Zeka stepped to a Cherbe, making a run off Corbellis and he ends up poking the ball in between Bakakis and Corbellis for Verratti and what we end up seeing there is that once that pass is played in, Insigne makes his run off Corbellis towards the box. Verratti now has the ball and Shatsidiakos does come across and as he comes across he pulls the ball back into the path of Insigne who fires a shot on goal but it did hit off Bouchalakis' hand that awarded Italy a penalty that Jorginho converted. Besides that, Insigne did have another first time opportunity that he fired inches wider than that from distance and by Kazetas did scuff a great chance in the box where he received the volley from a pullback but he scuffed it into the air and it fell into the hands of Donnarumma. Besides that we did see both sides turn to the bench with Greece bringing on Donis, Janolis and Mantelish. And we did see Bellotti come on for Immobile. But Italy did have one more chance that does highlight the difference between their first half and second half performance. And it does stem through Bernadeschi, who does drop off deeper to receive a squared pass from D'Ambrosio. And it forces Staffelidis out. What we see now is Bellotti occupies the center back there. And we do see Insigne make a darting run in between Bakakis and Chazidiakos. And when he makes that run in between there, 
all we see is Bernadeschi wrap the ball around Bellotti and the occupied center back for Insigne to receive that ball in right half space and fire an effort on goal that the keeper does stop. When we break down the game as a whole, Greece's initial game plan was superb. They stifled Italy in midfield. In the wider areas, they weren't really troubled. And frankly, they weren't tested in that first half. But as the game wore on, energy levels dipped. Bernadeschi's Arrival on the right-hand side gave Italy more flexibility rather than Chiesa just simply trying to get the ball on the touchline and run at markers. And we saw an improvement from Insigne and Italy down that left-hand side. And they did execute when Greece did have their miscommunications regarding their pressing. But let me know what you guys think. Can Italy cause a storm in Euro 2020. My biggest worry here is that if they didn't get that penalty, how would Mancini change the game to break down a Greek side that looked deserving of a point despite a few errors in that second half? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Don't forget I upload videos every day and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And that was your daily dose of the interviews.